Welcome to Commander's Tech, Weapons and Warfare in Context. Today, we'll be taking a closer look at Browning machine guns using the M1919 as our point of reference. The M1917 and the M1919 are virtually the same gun, only differing in the barrel, the cooling mechanism, and the sight positions, while the M250 caliber is very similar but scaled up. Last time, we explored the history and development of machine guns up to World War I and immediately post-war Browning designs. Today, we're going to get into the mechanism and the use of these types of guns. This particular gun is an M1919A4, which was sold to Israel probably in the 1950s, where it was converted to 308, 7.62 NATO. While the original caliber for the M1919 was 30 6 Springfield, the guns were converted to many other calibers, particularly 8mm Mauser and 7.62 NATO, 308 Winchester. This gun came back to the U.S. as a parts kit and was then rebuilt as a semi-auto. Yes, this is a real M1919A4, but it is restricted to semi-automatic fire. One of the big differences with machine guns versus conventional rifles is the use of indirect fire. Like artillery, machine guns can be deployed to engage targets that the gunners cannot see. Using the traversal and elevation tool, which is located over here, which helps to connect the gun to the tripod, the relative position of the barrel, and thus the point of aim, can be set. Machine guns are not accurate weapons in the conventional sense, but are area saturation weapons. The area targeted by the machine gun is called the beaten zone, and it forms an extended oval. The dimensions of the beaten zone are adjustable by altering the elevation, but anywhere within the targeted area will be in danger of being struck by the deadly rain of bullets. The techniques of indirect fire with machine guns were developed during the First World War when the British termed it barrage fire. The British would use entire batteries of Vickers guns for barrage fire against German positions, forcing enemy soldiers to keep under cover to avoid that deadly rain of 303 British rounds. To use indirect fire from a map, the gunners need to have prepared a grid map of the battlefield and position the gun with known zeros for points of reference, since when aiming. In addition, the gun team will need to have communication with forward observers, spotters, who can update them on enemy positions with reference to the established grid. Then, the gunner can set the traversal and the elevation of the gun to aim for the correct positions. As the positions on the battlefield change, the aim can be adjusted using the tools. Indirect fire can also be used in a more impromptu manner when there is a known target obscured by hard cover, 
like a hill slope. The gunners need to calculate the necessary trajectory to drop the bullets down onto the target, and then aim at the intervening obstacle, raining fire in an arc onto the hidden target. All types of indirect fire need to be used cautiously, particularly as friendly forces could be located between the machine gun emplacement and the target, and bullets will be flying over their heads. These, along with most other techniques of modern warfare, require organization in a solid chain of command where command knows where their assets are located and where the enemy is. A good introduction to techniques for indirect fire can be found in The Employment of Machine Guns from the Naval and Military Press. The book is a collection of British military training manuals on machine gunnery from the end of the First World War. While the book is dated in some regards, the underlying information hasn't really changed all that much in the use of heavy machine guns, although today you likely wouldn't need to solve trigonometric equations by hand when calculating trajectories to aim the gun. The belts for the 1919 can be either cloth or disintegrating links. Cloth belts are the same ones used in the M1917 and would also work with the 1895. The metal links were introduced for aircraft use in the 1930s, but they never fully replaced the cloth belts during the gun's service life. Today, cloth belts are easier to get, but harder to use, so the disintegrating links are preferred. When loading the gun, the top cover can be opened and the belt placed in the action. Then, the cover closed, locking the belt in with the feed pawl. Alternatively, cloth belts have metal tabs can be inserted through the belt feed slide, locking into the correct position. With disintegrating metal links, starter tabs can be used to serve the same purpose. This allows for quicker loading without opening the top cover. Work the charging handle to strip out the first cartridge and load it into the breech. The cartridge is pulled back from the belt, dropped down below the line of the belt, and then inserted into the chamber. The action of moving the bolt back and forward causes a cam to actuate the feed pawl, moving the belt along so the next cartridge is in position. The cloth belts will continue to the right when emptied, while links and spent casings will be discarded below the gun. Today, we're using dummy ammunition to demonstrate the loading and feeding process without risking any kind of negligent discharge. The dummy rounds are slightly shorter than real 308, so they have some little feed issues if the base of the cartridge is not back all the way.
The M1919 is a closed bolt design, meaning the gun uses a firing pin and striker in the bolt, which fires the gun when the bolt is closed and locked. As a recoil operated gun, the entire barrel moves back in battery when it fires. Because they fire from the closed bolt, heat is a particular issue with Browning machine guns. Excessive heat in the barrel can cause a cook-off when ambient heat from the barrel causes the powder in the chambered round to ignite, firing the gun without pulling the trigger, potentially even causing runaway full-auto fire. While the M1917 used a water jacket as a heat sink to dissipate the heat, the 1919 is meant to be more mobile, and so the water jacket was done away with. Instead, it has a heavy barrel, which can absorb more heat in the first, which can absorb more heat in the first place. Supplementing that barrel is the barrel is covered by this perforated heat shroud, or perforated barrel shroud, to move air over the barrel and to assist in cooling, as well as to help keep the gunner's hands off the hot barrel and prevent burns. Still, you've got to be careful, even the heat screw, even this heat shield can get pretty hot. I'll be getting this piece out to the range in the near future, along with a number of other classic weapons, so be sure to check it out. Thank you for watching, and if you haven't already, please like and subscribe, and you can follow us on Twitter at jcmeyer119.